Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation at Shelter Rock. I am Nancy Reed McKee. I'm the ministerial intern here this year. This congregation is also served by <clears throat> Reverend Ned White, Reverend Natalie Fenimore, and by Reverend Jennifer Brower, who is on sabbatical until February. We are a faith that believes we are in this world to be part of creating the beloved community. To that end, we balance our need for spiritual renewal and connection with our need to be active, working to heal this world. Our forums are part of our way to shed light onto some of the dilemmas we face in our work, and we are glad all of you are here to share this time with us. May the flame here lit be to us a symbol of the torch that is passed from hand to hand and life to life, of caring and concern and the passion for involvement which have marked men and women of our liberal faith for many generations. My name is Colin Woodhouse. I'm chair of the Shelter Rock Forum. Uh, I want to make sure that you all feel welcome here today. You certainly are. I especially want to welcome those people who may have some objection to the premise being offered tonight. You are absolutely welcome, okay? It's not all about agreeing, and uh, the forum is meant to trade ideas, exchange ideas, talk in a civil, rational, and emotional way about some of the opinions and expectations that we have. Basically, the purpose of the Shelter Rock Forum is to provide a platform for well-informed, well-reasoned, and often challenging opinions on issues of importance to us as evolving human beings who share this time and place on Earth. It is our goal to sponsor programs that are relevant to the human experiment that challenge us to reevaluate established cultural norms and to question the source of opinions that frame our individual worldviews. This year, the Shelter Rock Forum is honoring individuals of extraordinary moral courage who dedicate their lives to fairness, justice, and compassion in the belief that every human being has inherent worth and dignity. Richard V. Reeves, our speaker tonight, is one such person. Now, some of you may remember the famous Kenyan uh, graduation speech uh, done by uh, David Foster Wallace. It starts, it's called uh, This is Water, if you remember that. And it starts with a parable. There's these two young hip fishes that are swimming in the water. You know, they might be from Brooklyn, you know, their pants are down a little bit low and, you know, their uh, fins are pushed up. And they swim by this older fish. And the older fish says, Hey, boys, how do you like the water? And the two young fish swim on a little bit further and they look at each other and say, yo, bro, what the hell is water? <laughs> so, um, we are very fortunate to have with us tonight Brookings Institution scholar Richard Reeves. Well, not really an older fish, he is a wise one who's bravely churning up the quiet ponds across America and making waves so that we might better see those dangers lurking in the rocks below. Now, I know that Richard's from England, so he might be a bit of an invasious species, but we're gonna let that go. All right, is that okay, Richard? <laughs> um, but really, he's uh, an amazing scholar. Uh, Richard is senior fellow of, of economic, in economic studies and co-director on the Center on Children and Families with the Brookings Institution. His research focused on social mobility, inequality, and family change. Prior to joining Brookings in 2013, he was director of strategy to the UK's deputy prime minister. Um, Richard's publication, his latest, is uh, Dream Hoarders, How the American Upper Class is Leaving Everyone in the Dust, Why That is a Problem, and What to Do About It. In September 2017, Politico magazine named Richard as one of the top 50 thinkers in the United States. Big deal, this is a big deal. Um, for his work on class and inequality, 
Uh, one thing I didn't mention that the forum is going is working on income inequality is one of our themes this year. Another theme is racism and white privilege and white supremacy. And we're going to be touching on those uh, difficult subjects and hopefully enlightening um, the community in which we live. Um, lastly, um, Richard uh, is also a former European business speaker of the world. So, of the, sorry, not of the, of the year in, in Europe. Um, he has a BA from Oxford University and a PhD from Warwick University. So let's give a warm welcome to our guest of honor, Richard Reeves. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Well, that was embarrassing. <laughs> I was embarrassed enough to be described as a person of moral courage. I have to tell you that I've taken a photograph of that poster where it describes me that I've sent it to all my friends and family and they're getting a, a big kick out of it. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Colin, for that incredibly warm welcome and to all of you for coming and giving your time uh, and to Nancy for kicking us off so well. Um, at the beginning. Uh, we've had beautiful music. Uh, we have a beautiful candle. Uh, I've had a very beautiful welcome, not only from Colin, but from Latifa. Thank you so much for the welcome to your home. And so I'm going to ruin everything with lots of charts and arguments. There's not much beauty in my presentation, but hopefully some truth at least. Um, and I'm also very grateful, Colin, for you mentioning the Politico 50 most influential thinkers in the US. I have to say that in previous years, I've always thought that was a stupid list. Completely subjective, made up, clickbait. It didn't seem to me to bear any relationship to what was really happening, you know, annoying. But this year, <laughs> it's really nailed it. <laughs> it's a great list. Uh, I didn't know you were going to mention the European Business Speaker of the Year thing. That was a very long time ago. Um, when actually I was funding myself to write a biography of John Stuart Mill, the 19th century liberal philosopher, and the way I was funding it was by passing myself off as a business speaker so that I could charge business audiences a little bit of money, and then I would run home and go back to John Stuart Mill. And interestingly, the love of John Stuart Mill's life, Harriet Taylor Mill, who was, uh, like him, a great feminist and one of the leaders of the women's suffrage movement in the UK, uh, was introduced to him by a Unitarian minister. Um, in North London at, at a dinner party and uh, she and her then husband who subsequently died were very strong Unitarians and at the time actually there was a strong connection in 19th century London between the Unitarian uh, church and the rise of radical political movements led by people like Jeremy Bentham, James Mill and then in turn John Stuart Mill uh, who became one of the great liberal philosophers and uh, ardent um, spokesman not only for the rights of women um, and ethnic minorities but also free speech and of the need for respectful disagreement. So to that end, I would be astonished if everyone in this room agrees with what I'm about to say. And I do, and I do welcome your disagreement. Also, when these cards were handed out and the European Business Speaker of the Year thing was mentioned, I was reminded of a time when I was actually given these after I'd given a speech, uh, when you get the feedback forms afterwards to see how you did and so on. And people had written on these cards what they thought of my speech. And one of, and one of them had written, if I only had an hour left to live, I would choose to spend that hour listening to Richard Reeves speak. I was incredibly touched by that. And then I realized it went on to the other side, and it said on the other side, because that would feel like a lifetime. <laughs> I, was t I, I was assured I didn't need to touch it, but I may have ruined everything. Is that better? All right, fine. I'll start again. Should I start again? Anyway, assume two excellent jokes that worked. <laughs> uh, and also, as my uh, bio uh, and probably my accent has given away by now, I'm not from around here. Um, I'm from the UK, and it becomes part of the story. But I am now a US citizen. In October of last year, I took US citizenship. Um, and in fact, I took US citizenship on the very last day that you had to, in my state of Maryland, in order to be eligible to register to vote in the presidential election. And of the 53 people from 47 different nations who 
took the oath of allegiance on the day that I did. Every single one of us went straight from our ceremony to the Women's League of Voters um, and registered to vote. I have to say that it was uh, an important day for me, but I already had a green card. For me, it was largely about wanting to be a citizen of my new home. But for many of the people who were around me, uh, it was clearly a very much bigger deal altogether. And in fact, the woman standing next to me with a child in her arms, with tears rolling down her cheeks as we said the oath of allegiance together was from Afghanistan. She was one of five people from Afghanistan who had taken the oath of allegiance that day, as well as people from Iran, Iraq, Mexico, etc., from around the world. Has anyone, who, hands up who's been to a ceremony, a citizenship ceremony, or participated in one? Um, they are really extraordinary experiences, aren't they? And I felt very privileged to be part of it. Having said that, very excited to register to vote. So I got to vote in the US presidential election. Also, because I'm still a UK citizen, I could vote by postal vote, by ballot, mail, uh, in the Brexit referendum on the EU. So it was really a banner year for me, politically. I had French friends texting me saying, don't take French citizenship. But and I didn't, and look what happened. Could be correlation. So I've warned you that there are some charts coming, and I now sort of realize that there's probably a bit too, too, too many charts. I'm going to skip over some of them. But Brookings Institution scholars, you know, we, we get anxious unless we have lots of charts. We need data, we need figures. Um, but I'm going to tell a couple of stories as well, really, which motivated me to write the book. And please jump in, stick your hand up if you want to ask a question as we go along, but there'll also be time for Q&A. Will you start waving at me when either I'm getting boring or you think it's time? Ah, you should read the card I've just written to you, by the way. It's just down there. So you'll get a kick out of it. I've, I've, I've asked myself a question, which I'm hoping that she will give to me. <clears throat> Do you like it? Um, so the first story is about uh, growing up in the UK, a class-bound society, a society where people, quote, know their place, where every interaction is somehow about figuring out where do you stand on the class hierarchy? How do you talk? What do you wear? Which knife do you use? What sport do you play? Uh, et cetera. This constant exhausting sense of trying to figure out just where you are in this unbelievably finely calibrated class system where just one slip and you can de de demonstrate yourself to be really not one of us. When I went to Oxford, I was the first um, to go to Oxford. Someone else had gone to Cambridge from my school. Um, and they have these kind of parties to welcome people and there was cheese and one of the cheeses was brie and I just cut some brie to have some brie you'd think that was a fairly straightforward thing to do wouldn't you but actually I then overheard someone saying in the background oh my god he's nosed the brie he's nosed the brie hands up who knows what nosing the brie is well thank god you don't live in England because everyone says, I can't believe he's done that. Turns out that with brie, triangular shape, you, you're supposed to just keep slicing it down the side. Okay? That's the thing to do. You don't cut the end off. Cutting the end off is called nosing the brie. Okay? And it's, it's really one of the ways you just give yourself away as being from the wrong side of the track. So I said, I, and I was like, and I turned to someone and I said, I didn't go anywhere near it with my nose. What are you talking about? I just cut it, picked it up. Anyway, it's a small example, but, but it's the, exactly the sort of thing that British people will talk about. And of course we have Downton Abbey, the Crown, the Royal Family, all that stuff, right? And so it's this very class-saturated society which I grew up in. And my mother, who had been upwardly mobile, my mother's Welsh, so to correct you, I'm not English, I'm half Welsh, half English and half Welsh. Um, and I can prove it by singing the Welsh National Anthem when I've had enough to drink. Um, she, because both she and my father had been quite strongly upwardly mobile, they both came from very modest backgrounds. Um, and we went to a very ordinary high school in a working class town, and my mother was terrified that we were not going to be able to rise up the British class ladder. And she was so terrified of that, she, she would threaten us with elocution lessons if we didn't speak properly. We relabeled them electrocution, because we thought that was funny. Um, one day I came home and I said the word computer with neither a P nor a T. I need a new computer. Kamura, because that's how some of my friends were talking at the time. It's very, it was, as I say, a pretty working class town. And she genuinely thought that unless we spoke correctly, that we would be inhibited in our rise up the British class ladder. By the way, she almost certainly wasn't wrong. Uh, and so she was constantly correcting the way we spoke. Three years at Oxford seemed to do the trick anyway. 
Um, but the other thing she was terrified about was that we would become members of some business uh, and there would be some sort of social event in a ballroom, a bit like the ballroom Colin showed me here earlier, and we'd be, everyone would be dancing and the boss would come over and, or the boss's wife, it was very sort of gendered, her view of this world, the boss's wife would say, oh, would you, like, would you give me the next dance or something? My mother watched a lot of television. Give me the next dance and we wouldn't be able to dance because we didn't know how to dance. And because of our inability to know how to waltz, or samba, or foxtrot, whatever it was, that would be the end of our upward trajectory. It would mean we won't progress. As a result of which, she forced us for a year to learn to ballroom dance. For a miserable year of my adolescence, every Saturday morning was spent in a dance studio learning how to cha-cha, and waltz, and rumba. And when I went home recently, the Guardian newspaper just carried an extract of my book where I tell this story. And she said, that's not true. I never made you do that. I never made you go to dancing lessons. I said, yes, you did. And I went up to my room and I got the box and I brought out all my certificates from the dance school saying, Foxtrot level one, waltz level one, samba level one. As it turned out, that wasn't a problem. The inability to know how to waltz didn't turn out to be that because, as it turned out, I you know, did most of my growing up in the 20th century as opposed to the 17th century. But anyway, the anxiety that it spoke to was real. Class, that was what was going to hold us back. The wrong social class. Um, and one of the things that I've loved about the idea of America, and I stress the idea, is this kind of sense that class doesn't weigh as heavily here. Um, but I've come to believe that by moving from the UK to the US, I've moved from the frying pan to the fire. And that actually the American class system operates at least as ruthlessly and at least as effectively as the British one that I left behind. The big difference being that in the US, it does so under a veneer of the classless society. It does so uh, camouflaged by the myth of meritocracy. At least in the UK, posh people have the decency to feel guilty, some of the time. Not so much here. Because here, the people who, become, who are successful are able to convince themselves that it is because of their own brilliance and their own diligence, and not because of any good fortune that they may have had, not, being able, not because of where the circumstances of their birth or anything else. And I've come to believe that is one of the deepest problems facing my new country, our country which is this lack of reflectiveness about the way in which systematically and structurally class inequality is perpetuated in this country. So we can watch Downton Abbey and the Queen, uh, the Crown, all we like, and think, oh, isn't that funny? Meanwhile, I think close to home, under this camouflage that I've mentioned, class is very much alive and well in the, in the US. So that's kind of one reason why it's not mentioned is that meritocracy. The second reason that speaks to one of your other major themes is because of the salience of race. Race, racism, racial injustice is such a very, very big part of the US inequality story that it has naturally tended to dominate conversations about inequality in this country. And that's all, as I say, for good and understandable reasons. The downside, though, is that it may have to some extent reduce some of the conversations about class, and in particular those who are in the upper class or the upper middle class, which will include many of us. So the story becomes necessarily personal um, because part of this is about seeing, I think the analogy of the water and the fish, is that when we think about income inequality, and as you address that in the speeches that are to come, when you read about income inequality, I do not know where all of you are on the income distribution. I know where I am. I know that I'm in the top 20% of the distribution, probably about the 90th percentile of the income distribution, a bit lower maybe now. I'm not in the top 1%, but I'm definitely the top 20%. The inequality is us. And the face of inequality sometimes is the one that's looking at looking us in the mirror. And that actually calls us to respond in a quite a personal way and not just a political way. And I'll get into some of that in a moment. Um, and so it's part of the story. I'm going to tell a story about somebody else. Yes, that is working. I hope, do you have to crane your necks a little bit? I apologize. So there are one or two people in the audience who are a little bit younger than the others. So just in case you don't know, this is Barack Obama, 44th president of the United States. Doesn't it feel like a long time ago? Doesn't it feel like a long time ago? It wasn't that long ago, though. It really wasn't that long ago, but anyway. My story, and the reason I ended up writing the book, starts with him. In January of 2015, 
he became the first president in living memory to ask his own party to vote against his own tax reform idea before his budget even got to Congress. He reversed course on a particular tax reform idea very quickly under intense pressure, not from the Republicans, but from his own party. And it was the moment that I decided I wanted to write about class, and in particular the upper middle class in the US, because it was an illuminating moment for me. Some of you may know the story or may remember the story, but just in case, I'm going to reenact it for you, as they say in Hollywood, based on true events. He's on Air Force One. He is flying from India to Saudi Arabia. With him on Air Force One is Nancy Pelosi, now the minority Democrat leader in the House. And Nancy received a phone call. She received a phone call from this man, Chris Van Hollen. Chris Van Hollen, at the time congressman from my district in Maryland, Montgomery County, Maryland, just outside DC, one of the most affluent places in the country. And he, uh, he's now the junior senator for Maryland. He's, he was elected to the Senate in the uh, election last year. And he calls up Nancy and says, we have a problem with this tax idea that the president's put out. We've really got to kill it. We've got to get him to change his mind about this tax reform. So she says, well, as it happens, I'm on Air Force One with the president. So I'll just wander down the corridor and see what he says. And she says, I agree with you. My constituents are very angry about this too. So she goes into his office on Air Force One. He's sitting on Air Force One. Knock at the door comes. Hello, come in. Who is it? Hi, it's Nancy. Hi, Nancy. How are you doing? Come on in. What's on your mind? It's this tax idea. It's a terrible idea. You've got to change it. You've got to reverse course on it. The president says, I'll consult with my senior advisors. And, get, and I'll think about it. Goes back to his office, having consulted calls the White House. Hello, White House, it's the President. I don't really know how these things work. You've got to kill this idea. Sure enough, the next day, the tax reform is dead. And the tax reform was to change the tax treatment of something called 529 college savings plans. Hands up who knows what a 529 college savings plan is. Hands up. Yes. An unusually high proportion, but that re that's a reflection of the levels of education and affluence and general knowledge of the world in this, um, in this group. 529 college savings plans, for those of you who don't know, they are, they are a way you can save to pay for your kid's college, or indeed any other relative's college, in a way that is exempt from capital gains tax at the point you take it out. Also, it's exempt from gift tax, so you can super fund it. The Obamas put quarter of a million into their girls' 529s in one year alone. Normally, you'd hit gift tax when you hit a certain level. It was immune to that, too. Most states also give you an income tax deduction, or many states give you an income tax deduction, including Maryland and New York State. So my wife and I can put $10,000 a year against our Maryland income tax, which saves us about $500 a year, by putting it into 529 college savings plans. In New York, it's similar. Nice thing about New York State is you only have to leave the money in for five days. Some of you might know that. Some of you really know your way around it. I didn't know that until after I wrote the book and I got emails. And people said, so you can put it into your 529 plan, claim the tax deduction in your tax return. Six days later, you can take it out. You don't even, you don't even have to leave it in there. It's a, great, it's a great thing. If you're not doing it, by the way, time to start. Again, straightforwardly a handout. It was a Bush era tax cut. George Bush put it through. Bill Clinton had vetoed it the year before. And yet, his, Obama's idea was to get rid of these going forward, was to say, these are giving money away. And if you don't believe me, believe the government's own figures. These are the poor, from the poorest people on the left to the richest on the right, quartiles, quarters of the population. The left-hand side is how many people in that income group have a 529 plan. The right hand is the average value of that 529 plan for those who have one. You keep going to the right, the number just goes up. I just published something last week which makes the same point. Of course, because you only pay capital gains if you're at a certain income level anyway. And by the way, in order to save money for your kids' education, you need money to save in the first place, and only people with money have that money. And so it is a straightforward tax giveaway to the upper middle class. It does not increase saving. It is the single most regressive element in the US tax code, in the sense that all, almost all the benefit goes to people at the top. Or that. Um, so Obama's idea was let's get rid of that and have a tax credit instead. It was killed by Pelosi, Van Hollen, and other liberal Democrats. This is the median income in um, Pelosi's seat on the left, Van Hollen's in the middle, and then the U.S. national average. They, they represent very affluent districts and highly educated districts. I should know 
as I said, Van Hollen was my congressman at the time. It was my neighbors, liberal Democrats, who were losing it over the loss of this tax break because they had come to feel entitled to it. They're anxious about the kids' education. They think they've worked hard. So the story of how a Bush era tax cut becomes a treasured tax break for the most liberal upper middle class Americans is the story that led me to write my book. Because I began to believe, along with Paul Waldman who writes in the Post, these people know how to look after themselves. The American upper middle class are not to be trifled with. Sure, they're not as rich as the 1%, and I'll get to that. There's a lot of them, and they run everything. Everything, tank, every newspaper, every church, every university academic department. To get into the top 20% child common in the US, you need a household income of about 125,000 or more. The average income for the top 20% is about 200,000. To get into the top 1%, you need 400,000. Now, people hear those numbers, and in New York, to get into the top 20%, you need a household income of about 150,000. Household income, 150,000 or more, you're in the top 20% of the New, of the New York um, distribution. Now, people very often react to those numbers, and I've kind of, reasonably enough, by saying, well, that doesn't sound like very much money. And for some people, it doesn't. But that's because they've lost sight of what the relative benchmarks are possibly because most of the people they know are also upper middle class, and so your benchmark gets distorted. Um, and so I decided that it was time to write a book. This, by the way, are the other tax expenditures, for the and the value of tax expenditures, these are just the tax credits, and, um, which is very much in the news at the moment, deductions, for the bottom 40, the middle 40, and the top 20, just in billions. The top 20 get way more than the middle 40 or the bottom 40. And in there, you've got pensions, you've got the health care deduction, mortgage interest deduction is a big one, state and local property tax deduction, and 529s. Um, so these tax breaks are actually kind of disproportionately headed towards the top. Interestingly, 529s, which are already here, come back to this distribution one, in the news again. Section 1201 of the Republican tax bill. Uh, alters 529 legislation in the following two ways. First of all, it will allow you to use your 529 savings not only for post-secondary education college, but also for K-12 private education. So it's now a tax subsidized vehicle for paying for private K-12 education. That's the first change. The second change, which is genuinely novel, unprecedented in the US tax code if it, if it passes, is to allow you to start saving into the 529 account of your unborn child. It'll be the first time that an unborn child has official tax status in the, in the tax code. Um, there are all kinds of implementation difficulties, as you can imagine, like when do you start saving? How do you know? Um, you really don't want the IRS asking these kinds of questions. So when did you conceive exactly? Well, it could have been that Saturday, couldn't it? But I don't think it might have been the Tuesday, because it matters, because you can't start saving until actually the moment of conception arrives. So as far as 529 tax legislation will concern, you will be a 529 tax unit from the moment of conception rather than from the moment of birth. If that passes, mark my words, section 1201 of that bill will pass into everyday usage, because that's quite a precedent to set. Now, it's trivial in its fiscal effects, of course, and what the IRS will probably do is just deduct nine months from the birth date, or I, honestly, I, don't, I just don't know. I've talked to tax scholars about how it'll work. Nonetheless, 529s are around, so it's almost as if, in many ways, what happened was that the Republicans read the work I'd done on 529s and said, hey, let's go even worse. I've then, they're more affluent. Now I'm gonna get very, very quickly, just in the interest of time, run through my argument. I have a lot more slides than I'm going to be able to show you, and I really want to kind of end up making the moral argument. One of the nicest reviews in my book described it as a moral argument thinly disguised as a policy pamphlet. Nicest thing anyone could have said about it. That's exactly what the book is. Because I've come to believe that it's not a lack of policy ideas. We know the kinds of things we can do to help create a fairer society, both nationally and locally. It's that we don't have a political culture which makes it easy to enact those changes. And one of the reasons we don't have a political culture is because we don't have a broader culture where those who are relatively affluent 
are taking responsibility for that position and being willing to give something up. The appeals to, to self-interest have run their course. We need a different kind of debate now about inequality, one that implicates ourselves in the inequality problem, rather than it always being about somebody else, either the super rich or the poor, but never about us. Because it is about us if you're in that top 20%. So I wrote the book, and here's basically my argument, is that there's separation, it endures across generations, there's a difference between relative and absolute, I'll skip that. I'm gonna make the case for downward mobility, which no one ever makes. And then I'm gonna talk about how it works, market meritocracy and opportunity hoarding, and then how we have to solve this I'm not rich problem. So as I say, I'm gonna skip some of these. First of all, the separation, all right. I am very critical of the we are the 99% rhetoric. The May Day Occupy Wall Street march, three, uh, a third of the people there had earnings of 100,000 or more, earnings, personal earnings. That puts them in the top 10% of earners, but they were marching against inequality because they were marching against the top 1% or the plutocrats or the whoever it is at the top. In the interest of fairness, if you want to tell a 1% story, you show a chart like this. This shows you the real incomes at the top, the top 1% since 79. The line below is the 19% below them. The line below that, 40% below them. And the line below that, 40% below them. So 99% of the population is captured in those lines right there at the bottom, while the 1% are galloping away. Quite right, Occupy Wall Street, top 1%, et cetera. However, social scientists do their dirty work in two places, the footnotes and the left-hand axis. The left-hand axis goes up to $2 million. It has to, to capture the top 1%. That's how you make a dramatic chart. Anyone want a seminar on how to make a dramatic chart? I can give you it. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take the top 1% out altogether. Not as exciting a chart. Top 1% don't even appear in this chart. I've got the bottom 40% of the bottom. This is what's happened to the incomes of the bottom 40% of the distribution. The next line up is the middle 40%, the next 40% up. The line above that is the 19% above them, but not the top 1%. So that line is not being pulled up by the top 1%, it's just the 19% of it. That's the real class fracture in US society. There's a lot of movement between the 19 and the one, but the basic story here is in income inequality, in the interest of your, but has not increased in the bottom 80% of the income distribution at all. The bottom 80% of US society looks in income terms exactly the same as it did in 1979. It's gone up a little bit, but it's gone up the same for everybody. There's no change. The pattern is exactly the same. All the action is above that. So when, if anyone ever says to you the gap between rich and poor is growing, that's wrong. The gap between the rich defined as the top 20% and everybody else is growing. So I think that's where it is, but it's not just there. You also see the retreat from marriage is not happening at the top. There's big gaps in health, big gaps in wealth, big gaps in life expectancy, culture, social capital, neighborhoods, etc. So you're seeing not only income gaps growing, but in all these other dimensions as well. Uh, and you put all those things together and you see a class fracture, not just measured in terms of money, but in terms of where we live, where we send our kids to college, where we work, who we worship with. We end up in bubbles, class-based bubbles, as well as race-based bubbles. And that means that our reference point is also being distorted as well. So in the interest of time, when should, how, when should I stop talking, do you think? Tomorrow sometime? How long do you want to talk for? Around? Another 10 minutes? All right, anybody bursting to ask me a question yet? Go on. No, no, I'm gonna let, I'm gonna let him ask a question. I'm bored of myself. Go on, ask a question. Huh, 20 minutes more. Oh, you're bidding how long you want me to talk for? Oh, what a good idea. Hands up, who thinks so I should stop right now? <laughs> <laughs> Hands up, who thinks I should go? Okay, one. I have a question. Okay. You do have 529. I was under the impression that you had to prove that it was going into education. Yeah. Why is there supposed to be a stiff penalty? That's correct. When you spend it, that's true. Uh, I'm not going to open up for questions, really. Don't worry. Don't worry. I just wanted to get a couple in. Um, if there's any clarification ones. Uh, it is true that when you spend the money, it has to be on educational expenses. And so if you've been claiming it all along the way, then you have to spend it, and it's only on certain things. But the point is that, in, at least in New York, 
you can take it out in the meantime and then find it again later, if you see what I mean. It doesn't have to be the same money. Whereas at least in most states, it has to stay in the same account and mature. So it's true that in your otherwise, if, if you subsequently don't spend that money, which you've claimed a tax deduction on in the earlier years, they'll come for you. But if you just say, oh, well, I'll find it later, I'll sell the house. So you could be claiming for 529s all the time, taking the money out every year, sell your house, then use that to fund them for college, and it would still count. Yeah, I didn't know it until after I wrote my book, and someone from New York said, oh, is this other thing, is that the thing in New York? Yes, go on. I'll do one more. Okay. Yes. If you think you're on the borderline, that's right. Although one university now, to my regret, is now offering lower tuition to people who, fa who pay out of their 529s. Um, look, they're, they're, they already exist. I have 529s for my two kids. I'm using it. Um, and what I do, for what it's worth, um, is calculate the exact tax benefit that I get from it from Maryland. I'll do the same with the capital gains thing and I give it to a charity in DC that works to help poorer kids get into college. Um, uh, I'm doing the same with the mortgage interest deduction, um, going to an affordable housing charity. And then, of course, I could claim a tax deduction on my charitable giving. I mean, there's literally no end to the ways in which the IRS wants to give me money. Um, as, as a non-American, it is extraordinary, actually. But um, that's how I deal with it, because actually, I am terrible at saving, so it is not a bad commitment device for me. But I'm I, I, would not, I would not be happy about taking the economic benefit of what I see as such an egregious tax break. So I choose to use that. And I literally, I calculate it to the dollar as to exactly what tax benefit I'm getting from. And I write a check for exactly that amount each year to this um, excellent organization in DC that happens to be run by a friend of mine that works with poor kids to go. Because I'm taking the thing that I'm finding so egregious and using the money to try and help other people to do it. So that's how I deal with it. Other people are going to have other ways to deal with it. Um, but uh, I also meant to ask, actually, is there anybody here who came for the other Richard Reeves, the famous historian? Yeah? I should have asked at the beginning. I'm very sorry. I normally do this at the beginning so that you can escape. Are you here to hear about Nixon or Kennedy? <laughs> I'm really sorry. Look, if you need to go, I understand. I, this happens to me every time. Every time. Occasionally he gets asked to speak at John Stuart Mill as well. Um, there's an equestrian artist who also has the same name, but I understand. I, I understand. If you, if you want to slip out now, then I will totally understand that you came to hear about. You know, the, no, no refund. All right, no refunds. All right. No refund. <laughs> so anyway, I'm just going to crack through a couple more things, but I'm not going to spend too much on it. I'm going to ignore all these because they're a bit boring. Um, that's boring. I'm going to talk a little bit about the difference between relative and absolute mobility. Just a bit. Just because that's instructive for the whole debate about opportunity in the US. Relative mobility is being is moving up and down the ladder, and it's a zero-sum game. You can only ever fit 20% of the population into that top quintile. So if someone's going to move up, someone else has to move down. It's a necessary fact. In, terms, in relative terms, you can only have upward mobility if you have downward mobility. Okay? It's, not a math, it's, not a, it's not a moral statement, it's a math statement. Absolute mobility means being better off than your parents were at the same age. So have you surpassed where your parents were in real terms? Right? They're very, very different ways of thinking about mobility. This is absolute mobility in the US. This is a simple measure of are you better off than your parents were when they were your age, depending on what year you were born, 1940 up to 1980 on the right. The bottom line here is that 90% of the people who were born in 1940 overtook their parents. 50% of the people born in 1980 have overtaken their parents in terms of their real, their real economic standard of living at the same age. Now, if you think about that for a moment, it's kind of obvious you're going to see that trend because the US economy grew by 4% a year between 1950 and 1973. It was pretty hard not to be better off than your parents were. And for black Americans, it was even a bigger increase because they had so much further. Their parents were so much poorer. So overtaking their parents was, if anything, slightly easier for the wrong reasons. Also think about the kinds of lives the parents had for the people who were born in 1940. They had spent their labor market years in the Great Depression. So you have this generation who grew up 
massively upwardly mobile by comparison to their parents, who can tell you story after story about, well, my, one of my colleagues at Brookings explains that the cows got electricity before he did because of the farm he was on, you know, how poor they were. And so you've got a whole generation of people who almost by definition are going to be better off than their parents, given the massive growth. But you now think that's the norm. And they also probably think that it's partly about their own merit and how well they did, whereas actually it was almost everything to do with the US economy, growing up 4% a year, and then the GI Bill, and then everything else that went with it. And so sure, you're better off than your parents. You would have had to try pretty hard not to be. Not so much now. With lower growth and higher inequality, many, many fewer people are going to automatically overtake their parents. But if you've come to believe that's the norm, that's a very painful transition. It's even worse in some of the Rust Belt states. You can see here the numbers are dropping even more. I won't spend much more time on that. But the, that sense of did you overtake your parents, absolutely fewer people were doing that in some of the states, including some of the ones, the ones that swung Trump. I'm going to skip that. Steve Perlstein, who's a friend of mine, describes the difference between relative and absolute mobility as absolute mobility is when everyone's going along fine. You're driving along a highway, fine. Someone overtakes you, someone gets a little bit better off than you, relatively speaking, you don't mind, you're all getting there anyway. We're growing 4% a year and we're sharing the proceeds of the growth. But if there's lower growth, as we have now, so 2% to the new 4%, and it's not as evenly shared, suddenly the road starts to feel a bit like this. Then you really care if someone cuts in then it really starts to feel congested. The stakes start to feel much higher, losing your place. And that's kind of how people feel now. They feel like the stakes are high, and so mobility gets much harder. It feels like we're getting stuck. And then people start getting very defensive of their position. Um, I'm briefly going to make the case for relative downward mobility, simply because if we can't, in relative terms, if we want people moving up into that top rung, you do need people coming off it. That's just a fact. There are some things are zero sum. You know, if you want more women in Congress, you need fewer men in Congress. If you want more African-American judges, you need fewer white judges. If you want more people from poor backgrounds to get into the top 20%, you need more people born into the top 20% to drop out of the top 20%. These are facts. <laughs> and we can't escape from them just because some, some of them might feel less comfortable than others. And actually, uh, my middle son, I was just talking to Nancy about, he, when he, he comes home, he's a standing joke now. He says, Dad, I have good news and bad news. The good news is you're always saying that we need more downward mobility. The bad news is, here's my report card. <laughs> and I'm like, yep, 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 you're definitely going definitely to do your bit there. <laughs> I joke with my friends, you know, each of us just choose one of our children, and we're going to sort of just give up, you know, be downwardly mobile. Uh, that seems a bit unfair. It's a bit biblical, actually. Like, yes, you can be downwardly mobile. Um, but nonetheless, we do need a bit of downward mobility. If you ask, if you, uh, someone did a great survey where they asked people how much upward and downward mobility there would be. And basically, uh, what, they, what they found was everyone's in favor of massive upward mobility, which is what the two charts on the left show. Liberals and conservatives agree about it compared to what there actually is. But no one wants downward mobility. I wrote a piece in the Times over the summer called Stop Pretending You're Not Rich which generated a certain amount of email traffic. Um, and one of the comments on the page before they shut down the comment field um, was this one from JB and Oak Pilot. There are many, many on it, which really stuck. I think it's true, and I do anticipate a bit of this in the book. One of the reasons why those people who are at the top, the upper middle class, as I define them, are so worried about their own position, but also really worried about their kids' position, is because it doesn't look very good down there. Remember the charts I showed at the beginning, what it's like for the middle 40. And so actually your incentives to protect your position and to protect your kids' positions are greater when there is greater income inequality, especially in a society where money matters so much. For a long time, I believed that you could tell everything about America from the movie Jerry Maguire. There's a scene in Jerry Maguire. Who's seen the film Jerry Maguire? The Tom Cruise film. Where the woman who joins him to go into the... Uh, business with him, Dorothy, played by Rennie Zellweger. They get into the elevator to go down. First thing she says to him, every European who watched the movie couldn't understand this. The first thing she says to him in the elevator is, you will have health insurance, won't you? And it's a moment where, every, I was like, what, what, what's she talking about? But of course in the US, and she had a kid who was sick. And so if 
if you only get healthcare with money, maybe you only get a decent house with money, money really matters. Plus, income inequality is higher. And so this is showing you if you were started that 90th percentile, 10% away from the top, and then go to the middle, this is roughly what the drop is in the uh, 90s on the left in the US versus other countries and now on the right. And so what that's telling you is, they, that may look dr terribly dramatic, but those are big differences actually in economic terms. It's just further to fall. So the drop from the upper middle class to the middle class in the US is further, economically speaking, and more costly, socially speaking, because you lose a lot of things along the way. And so we are highly incentivized to do everything we can to keep ourselves at the top and to prop our kids up. We put a glass floor underneath our children in a desperate attempt to stop them from being downwardly mobile because we don't like the look of it down there and because we're good parents. Part of my book is about the tension between wanting to do the very best for your kids and wanting an equal and fair society and recognizing the fact that those, those values will sometimes come into tension and that that's very uncomfortable. Those are uncomfortable moments because no one wants to treat their own child like a social policy intervention. I certainly don't. But equally, it cannot always be the case that wanting the natural desire to want the best for ourselves and our kids is always in alignment with our desire for a fairer and more equal society. Sometimes they will conflict, and that's where the action is. And there's two ways in which the upper middle class perpetuate themselves. First, by ensuring that their kids are so highly educated, they use the 529 plans to get them a great college education, they get them into the labor market. No wonder they do so well because they're good, they're highly skilled, they're meritorious in terms of how the market defines merit. And so we're gonna invest incredibly heavily in our kids' human capital development, their skills, their attributes, their soft skills, their credentials, very, very heavily, so that they will go on to succeed in the labor market. It's not really cheating, it's just making sure that before the game starts, they're incredibly well trained. By the time they hit the labor market, it's almost game over. I know roughly what someone's outcome is going to be by the time they hit 25. It's very hard to be upwardly mobile from 25 if you're not in the right place. It's where you enter the labor market that makes the big difference. And so no wonder we spend so much on college and everything else because we know that's what counts. So that's what happens. However, meritocracy has its downsides. And this is br the, brief, the brief British sociological history diversion. It'll take me one minute only, I promise. He made up the word for this novel, which is a dystopian novel. It's a warning about a society that comes to define itself as a meritocracy, it ends in a bloody revolution. And the warning he offers in the book, it, the whole point of the book is that a meritocracy is a terrible idea, that it will be very corrosive. Everyone took the word, no one took the meaning. And so Michael Young spent the rest of his life writing letters to the New York Times and the Guardian saying, that's not what I meant. First line of Goldman Sachs mission statement, we are a meritocracy, and I bet they are at some level in that narrow sense. And in the meritocracy defined by Michael Young, three things happen. One, inequality increases. Why? Because in a meritocracy, if I'm rich, it can only be because of how brilliant I am. I shouldn't feel bad about that. I certainly shouldn't want to be, have any of it taken away from me. After all, it's not like I was born into this privilege. I've earned it. Second thing that happens is, but the people who aren't doing so well in that society start to lose self-respect. Because after all, in a meritocracy, if you don't succeed, whose fault is it? It can only be your own fault. And so there's this corrosion of self-respect among the losers in the meritocracy. The third thing that happens is that people start marrying people who they think will have high IQ, high levels of education, etc., in an attempt to create even cleverer children. Sociologists now call that assortative mating. Very unromantic term. But it has become the case that actually people are now slightly more likely to marry across some racial lines than they are to marry across class lines. And so matching by class in the marriage market has hugely increased as well. And that's been assisted by the huge rise in the number of women college graduates, which means that you're now seeing increasing numbers of marriages that are made up of two college graduates, not just one, with everything that implies in terms of earnings and opportunity, et cetera. And then they invest very heavily in their kids. Their kids succeed, and so the wheel turns. This is a chart showing your parents' income across the whole distribution from left to right. And the left-hand the left axis, vertical axis, shows what percentage of the children from those households by income are in college between the ages of 20, 18 and 21. 
There's a red line, which is a line of best fit. And you know how sometimes social scientists put up those lots of dots and then you put a line through the middle saying that's this, you may have seen it. You're like, really? Is that a correlation? Trust me, that's a correlation. That's a relationship. That's an association. In fact, it's terrifying. Terrifyingly mechanical. So college is the great equalizer in theory and the great stratifier in practice. Why? Because the people who get to go to good colleges come from affluent houses and go on to do well. And we end up with what the economist calls a hereditary meritocracy. These are the colleges in the bottom 40 middle. What kind of colleges are people going to? Well, yeah, you're getting the picture by now. Top 20% of people, they go to selective colleges and Ivy Leagues. Uh, that means that almost all the students at the Ivies and the elites over on the right are from the upper middle class. 70% of the people at selective colleges now are from top 20% households. Even our colleges are becoming upper middle class bubbles. With all of that might imply. And by the way, those numbers are not getting better over time. Let's pick on a few. Um, some of them more local than others. This is now by quintile. Where do the students come from? At Harvard, at UC Berkeley, SUNY Stony Brook, and Glendale Community College. By income quintile, poorest on the left to richest on the right. There are more undergraduate students at Harvard from the top 1% than there are from the bottom 60%. So if you want to see where the US class system is illuminated in bright lights, it is in our post-secondary education system. It's on our campuses. Our middle class kids go to selective colleges or Ivies. Middle middle class kids go to four-year publics if they get a decent run at it. And kids from the bottom 40% go to two-year community colleges. And those who are tricked into it go to for-profit colleges where they take on huge debt and default. The only sector of the college education system that has increased the number of poor kids going to it in the last 15 years is the for-profit sector. Only the profits. The for-profit colleges have come to see that there is an element of the American dream that they can sell. And you only have to look at the way they advertise and the channels they advertise on to see that it's a form of predatory marketing. You take an element of the American dream, a bit like owning a home. Now it's you have to get a college degree. You then sell it to people who are actually not in a position sometimes to be able to judge the quality of the education they're going to get. Sometimes they're not very well prepared for it. Then make the debt expensive. Then they drop out. Or they get a qualification that is not worth anything. And that's where the student debt crisis is. At the bottom of the distribution, not the top. If you spend a lot of money to go to a really good college, I don't care about your debt. You're going to be able to pay it off. So no more about how expensive the four years are, or the IVs are, or whatever. If you, go to a, if you spend a lot of money to go to a good college, you will, on average, be fine. It's the people who are spending $10,000 to go for a profit that gives them a terrible education. Trump University is the tip of the iceberg, let me tell you. So that's when it really hits the road. I'm going to skip Bernard Williams' Warrior Society, although I love it, just because I want to move on to my final part of my argument, which is, look, step, step one is we educate and cultivate our kids in these various ways so that they become awesome. And their awesomeness guarantees them a success in the labor market, and so they remain upper middle class, hereditary meritocracy. There are lots of ways in which we're able to do that, which I think are deeply unfair, and the funding of post-secondary education is extraordinarily unfair, and so credit where it's due. The Republican tax bill is going to tax college endowments. Thank you. About time. Because some of those endowments are enormous. And they need to be taxed. And we can use a bit of that money maybe to fund the community colleges who fund our most vulnerable kids who do so with, re with leaking roofs and underpaid teachers. So yes, time for some redistribution. But the other thing we do is we cheat a little bit. It's not just winning the maritime, and we cheat by opportunity hoarding. We opportunity hoard by taking some scarce goods that are valuable, over-consuming them on our behalf by rigging the market in our favor. And if you want to understand the difference between the, the working of a meritoc meritocratic inequality and hoarding inequality, the analogy that I've tried out is take a, and I'll change the genders the way I normally do it, take a mother who helps her son to get onto the local baseball team by practicing with him every night after school. She's throwing the ball to him. Every night after school, he gets good enough to get on the team. We'd think that was good, wouldn't we? Yes? We'd, be, we'd applaud her and we'd applaud him. Great. Another mother down the road bribes the coach $500 to get 
her son on the team and he gets on the team. Anyone feel good about that? No. Well, why not? No law has been broken. And in both cases, the parent have given something up, time and energy in the first case, money in the second case, to advance their children's best interests. Why the difference? The difference is it offends against a basic sense of fairness and that the people who are on the team should be the people who are best to be on the team. And sure, if some parents work harder than other kids, together, then that will result in some inequality, which we can try and do something about. But we don't cheat. We don't rig the market, do we? Oh, yes, we do. We do it in some of these different ways. Through exclusionary zoning, the way we zone our housing market, legacy preferences into college admissions, and the way we hand out internship opportunities. I don't mean your kind of intern. Maybe I do. I don't know. Let's find out. Um, and I could go into great length on each of these, but I won't. I'll just make the point that, the big, that in terms of impact on the opportunity structure, clearly housing market and zoning is the biggest one. But symbolically, I would say legacy preferences is pretty salient and internships is a growing issue. It's a growing problem because internships get more important. So exclusionary zoning, what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is housing is getting much more expensive, especially in the areas that are growing fastest. That's a big problem. It hasn't been a problem historically in the US, but land is a big problem now. This is a measure of how expensive houses are in red, average incomes in blue. That's especially the case in the richer cities. Why? This is a measure since 1940 of how many court cases include land use regulation. A spike caused by um, all kinds of things, but uh, very often it was, re it was just changing one word in a racist zoning uh, ordinance. Um, to take out the explicit racism and actually it remains classist and implicitly racist because you have single density family dwelling, you have all kinds of things which basically make the, their land more expensive, makes it harder to get lower even middle income housing on there, which means that we get to hoard the opportunities of the land. We hoard land. We do so subsidized by the federal government through the mortgage interest deduction, which costs $70 billion a year and does not increase home ownership. It increases the number of people buying expensive houses. Again, egregious. And then we organize our education system on a geographical basis. In some areas, we draw the school district lines very cleverly too. And interesting, I was looking at Long Island, I've got a report coming out. Long Island's got a lot of really small school districts. Um, and so actually on Long Island, the racial segregation within districts doesn't look too bad. But that's because you're doing all your, racial, all your racial segregating between school districts by where you draw your say, And you're seeing increased secession of school districts. Now, then you fund it through local taxes. Then you can zone everybody else out. And you all do so subsidized. So I'm not saying some evil genius came up with a system where they said, I know, let's subsidize people to buy expensive houses. Then we'll organize our education system geographically. And then we'll allow them to use local laws to zone out everybody else to protect both of those things. I'm not saying an evil genius did that. I'm saying if they had, it might look a bit like that. I'm not saying anyone intended it, but that's a pretty efficient machine for class reproduction. And a lot of us are on the wrong side of it. And our immediate self-interest and our immediate concerns are going to be to protect our own position. As long as that remains the case, we're likely to succeed. This is an LA zoning thing. We don't need that. I'll do legacy admissions next. Just because, seriously, a hereditary principle in college admissions only country in the world that does it? Yeah. Yeah, we wiped it out in the UK in the middle of the 20th century. Royal family can't get into Oxford and Cambridge now. The grades aren't good enough. So they go to St. Andrews instead. Which is great for St. Andrews because now all the American students want to go to St. Andrews as well. And they charge them a fortune for doing it. Then, so St. Andrews does well. But my point being that we wiped it out. It was seen uh, uh, by all universities as an outrageous principle to operate. It was racist in origin. It was introduced in the early 20th century to keep Jewish students out of the Ivies and then spread. It very successfully kept Jewish students out, actually, because if you give a tip to people who've got parents or relatives who went to a college, it acts in a straightforwardly racist way because all the Jewish students were kept out because their parents didn't go because they weren't here. So it was really hard for them to go. Just the same, it's very hard for many immigrants now to have parents who went to those places or to historically excluded groups like black Americans. They don't get legacy for it. They get other kinds of affirmative action policies which are an attempt to address some of those issues. My point simply being hereditary principle is embarrassing. And any of us who use it or support it need to take a hard look in the mirror. 
I bet I'm going to get some questions. Now, they say, look, it doesn't make that much difference, but these are the admissions rates for people who've got legacy status and those who do not, although actually just average admissions for those colleges. Okay. Uh, the legacies are probably stronger applicants for all kinds of reasons that we can think about. Seems to me that's unlikely to explain all of the difference in the legacy admission rate. Maybe it's symbolic, but it is a zero-sum game. Every place that's taken by a legacy is a place that doesn't go to somebody else, and it shreds the very idea of a meritocratic admissions process. It is time for it to go. Lastly, internships. Internships are becoming more important in the labor market. Employers rank them as the most important thing that someone can have done coming out of college now. And so how they're allocated becomes hugely important. Are they allocated meritocratically, or are they done on a grace and favor basis? The mayor of New York, Michael Bloomberg, got a special waiver to get Emma Bloomberg an internship in City Hall. Outrageous, but it was Bloomberg, right? What's the first thing Bill de Blasio does when he becomes mayor? Gets two waivers for internships in City Halls for his son and daughter. What shocked me about that story was that no one was shocked. It would have been political suicide in the UK or most other countries in the world to ask your own ethics commissioner to issue a waiver so that you can, against City Hall policy, give an internship to your own children. It would be unthinkable in most other nations. Here, everyone's doing it. And at some point, whether it's legacy preferences or voting against low-income housing or internships, people will come back to, well, I don't like it, but everyone's doing it. What am I supposed to do? And the answer, the hard answer is stop doing it. Because if you don't, who will? And in the end, everyone's doing it is a pretty weak moral argument. If my kid comes home from school and says, I cheated at school today, but everyone was cheating, do I say, well, that's OK then? As long as everyone's cheating, cheating's fine. Or at some point, do we have to stop? The last thing I'm going to say is that um, I've been asked to read more Richard Hofstadter, who is getting more and more relevant by the day. Um, he talks about the conspiratorial mind and imagination in American politics. But I've been, I read it as Age of Reform on the progressive era. I think we need a new progressive era in US politics, and it's one of the reasons I'm proud to be a US citizen now, to try and be, play a very small part in doing that. But the progressive era wasn't just a bunch of policies. People were afraid, for one thing. There was, there was violence, of course. And I'm not suggesting for a moment that the progressive era was progressive for all Americans. It clearly was not, especially on racial lines. However, to the extent that the progressive era did bring about some good results, it was preceded by what Hofstadter calls this. He says, the moral indignation of the age was by no means directed entirely against others. Contrast today, where it's always about the top 1% of the poor. It was in great and critical measure directed inward. Inward. Contemporaries who spoke of the movement as an affair of the conscience were not mistaken. An affair of the conscience. Jerry Cohen, who's a philosopher who moved from Marxism to a form of Christianity, wrote a book called If You're an Egalitarian, How Come You're So Rich? Great book. Great title. He said, social justice isn't just found in structures and institutions and laws. Social justice is found in the thick of everyday life. And I have come to believe that unless we embrace inequality and we do about it, not only in the way we vote and think and donate, but in the thick of everyday life, in our schools, in the way that we are thinking about our school districts, in our, the way we think about college admissions, in the way we appoint interns in our institutions, in all of the above, in the thick of everyday life, which is in some ways a kind of deeply religious way of thinking about it, in the thick of everyday life then we'll never get the kind of culture that we need to bring about all the changes that we want to. It's a long haul, but my hope is that in a small way, my book can just at least begin the conversation. I'll stop with that and take any questions. Thank you. Yeah, if you would just... Uh, uh, Write your questions and we'll pick them up and we'll give uh, Richard some challenges. What is the significance of the revelations from the, Par from the Paradise Papers regarding the Panama. use of offshore accounts? Panama Papers. I don't know what that means, but... Uh, <laughs> Definitely it's Panama Papers. I'm just a... Unless there's a whole one. Do you know that, Richard? I do. So what's the implication of it? Um, 
Well, that's the top 0.1% problem by and large. What it shows is that, that very wealthy people will almost always find a way to avoid national tax jurisdictions if they can. It requires global coordination. It requires international treaties. It requires the tax authorities of countries around the world to collaborate to prevent them from doing that. That requires an internationalist mindset, which we are in danger of losing in the US. So I think there'll be more leakage of money abroad than we're currently seeing. Um, I would support any measures to tighten those tax loopholes and bring the money back. There is an extraordinary amount of money which goes offshore, but it is not my field and slightly different to the people I'm talking about um, who I think don't generally have the resources to be sending hundreds of millions of dollars abroad. Uh, I'm in favor of catching them, but it's not my main concern. Richard, I think um, I sent a number of emails to professors, or local professors, and we've gotten quite a few, I would call, academic questions that I'm not qualified to ask, so I'm going to hand it over to the floor. So oh. if you will, just raise your hand, I'll give you the mic, and then we'll have some uh, discussions here. So, um, yes. Uh, good evening, I'm Dee Spintelis. I would like to make a comment on one of your charts, going back to the uh, legacy admissions. Okay. Now, <laughs> this is very much, in my opinion, one of the um, Disraeli uh, lies, damn lies, and statistics. Mm -hmm. Because if um, you look at something I know about, the Princeton admissions, you say 33% are legacy, uh, legacies. However, no, 33% of legacy admi admi applicants get in. That's correct. Yes. However, of the overall student population, it's only 13%. That's just a different statistic. Well, exactly. So only so, one in seven of the Princeton students actually there are legacies. That's correct. your defense. That's correct. And. If you look at how many students are actually qualified from all of the applicants. Okay, well, so there's two different parts to your defense. There first, are, the, the first you know, part of your defense, if I may say so, is fairly weak. If your defense is, but only 13% of the Princeton students are the children of Princeton graduates? Only? I would say Okay, that's not all right. Enough. I. Oh, maybe that isn't only. I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare to put the word only in front of that number. Of all the people, of all the students in the US, 13%, one in seven of the students of stable one of the students of Princeton are legacies. Do you think that's low? I think that's not terribly high. I think a much larger problem is the people getting in on athletic scholarships okay. that have all right. no all right. so let's no just, just let's academic. Do, great. Uh, thank you for your questions. It, it, and I, and I, I really mean thank you for the. We're going to have to agree to disagree about whether 13% is high or low, okay? I can tell you that if at Oxford, 13% of the kids at Oxford had parents that had gone to Oxford, there, there would be questions in the House of Commons. It just wouldn't stand. No way would that stand as another. But we're going to have to leave that. I think that your benchmark for what's low has been distorted by the US college education system. However, the other point you make, I think, is a real one, which is we don't know how qualified they were. And it could be that all you're seeing is the fact that they're much more qualified anyway. Um, the difficulty is we would only know that if we had the data on the GPAs, SATs, some sort of data on the different um, applicants by legacy and non-legacy status. We could then do a really good st study of it. None of them will share their data with anybody. Senator Kennedy put an amendment in the higher education bill not long before he died saying, at the very least, they should be forced to share their data on legacies, and anonymously, of course, on legacies and non-legacies, so we can see what's going on. So we can answer your question, which is a good social science question. Not a single one of them will release the data. Now, I think, yeah, they won't release it. Now, why won't they release it? There's two possibilities. One is that I'm right, and the other is that you're right. So it's a good way to end, end the end. If I'm right, and it's making a big difference, they maybe don't want that to be known because it offends some meritocratic principles. Or, if you're right and it's not making much difference, in fact, they might not want their alums to know that because they want them to keep giving lots of money. And so either way, it would be good to know. <laughs> and it seems to me that if they have nothing to hide and you know Princeton, give me the data. 
I'll have the answer for you by the end of the day. Richard, Sorry. I have a question here. There are three fundamental areas where the, in the U.S. where the U.S. is obscenely expensive, housing, health care, and college education. Aren't these the main reasons this generation is not doing as well as mommy and daddy? Um, no. Um, the, the figures on not doing as well as mommy and daddy are not related to those costs directly. Um, they are related indirectly in the sense that if those are captured in the inflation, no, this is going to get very wonky, but if they're captured in the inflation measure that's used to correct for real terms, then it will be indirectly affected. But it's mostly that you're seeing just much lower wages and actually a big increase in the number of single earner households, single parent households, that's driving down those absolute mobility numbers. Um, I'm not an expert on any of those particular um, uh, affordability measures that you mentioned, but I will say that they are having an effect on the disposable incomes of the younger generation because they are having to spend more of their money on those than perhaps in prior generations. And all of those markets are inflationary in the US because the market's really badly structured. The housing market is really, really stuck um, around regulation and zoning. The healthcare market is horrible in the US. It's the worst of all worlds. It's neither a socialized system nor a proper market system. It's this ugh, which drives up costs and the health insurance companies are incentivized to drive up costs. And as for college, what well, all they're doing, all the colleges are doing, the, the ones who are getting really expensive at the top, they have discovered that there is almost no limit to what parents are willing to pay to give their children what they consider to be a very slightly better education. And boy, are they milking it. And so it's actually one of those markets where it turns out the demand side is limitless. Because people will just keep paying and paying and paying and paying. And to say to your kid, I'm sorry, sweetheart, I know you've got into Georgetown, where I teach part of the time, um, but it's $70,000 a year. And candidly, I think that the University of Maryland at $10,000 a year would be a much better deal. And I'm not paying for it. Would make them a bad parent. I think it just makes them a better accountant. But who's going to say that to their kids now? No one dares to say it. They just literally, they'll mortgage their house, give up their pensions, remortgage their house to do anything, to pay whatever the colleges choose to charge. It's outrageous. Richard. Let's cut to the chase. The big question, how are we going to fix this? What are your recommendations? Um, you know, you've given us a, a, an expose of the problem. Yes. We need to know, I, I would say, what are we as uh, perhaps uh, participants in this situation? What can we do? What are your recommendations? Okay. Um, Let's leave it there. That's what I think a lot of us want to know. So someone said it was a moral argument thinly wrapped up, thinly disguised as a policy pamphlet. And there is a chapter in there on policy recommendations, and it's pretty weak, to be honest. It's the tepid chapter. I'd skip it if I were you. Um, but I had to put it in there because I work for a think tank. Um, for what it's worth, and it, vet, and it sort of seems to oscillate between big structural policy changes and tiny things we do in our own lives. But I actually think that that's, those are the sorts of connections we need to make. So the short version is massive increase in, in spending on family planning and effective forms of contraception, where the US is a laggard in the world. Um, more American women under the age of 25 have used an illegal drug than are using an effective contraceptive form of contraception. The gaps in unintended pregnancy rates are enormous and a significant contributor to inequality, in my view. Secondly, investing in early years education and home visiting. There is a home visiting bill up for reauthorization now in Congress and bipartisan support before. If they don't pass at this time, then I will be extremely disappointed because it's an evidence-based program to help two and three-year-olds. Why don't we try throwing some money at the problem in K-12? Arnie Duncan said that for $10 billion a year, you keep a 50% pay rise to every teacher teaching in the poorest 20% of schools. $10 billion a year for a 50% pay rise to the teachers teaching in the poorest schools. That's literally a drop in the ocean. $70 billion for mortgage interest deduction. So yes, I know there'd be huge problems to find a way to do that. And then on some of these other issues, 
We should basically, if we're not going as far as to abolish unpaid internships, which I don't think we will, we should regulate internships very strongly. We should abolish legacy admissions. We should withhold federal funding to institutions that operate a hereditary principle in their admissions procedures. Um, and we should um, support at a state level especially hugely inclusionary zoning policies which don't allow local areas to use their local zoning to trump the local housing market and the need we have for economic dynamism and low or middle income housing. Um, and on a personal level, we create a culture within, within which all of the things become more possible by actually considering how we spend our own time. I'll give you examples. I've given you a few examples of my personal life. I could give you more. Um, one of the hardest conversations I had with my son was when he said, will you get me an internship at your publisher? And I said, no, no, I won't. You can what get, are the political uh, excuse me, what are the political implications of inequality? Can you draw a connection of inequality and populism today? So I was coming to a peroration. I thought it was my last question, and you threw in another one there. Um, yes, I think there is a connection. Uh, I think that to the extent that some, I should caveat all of this by saying, <laughs> the rise in populism refracted through racism um, has allowed people, has allowed very skilled politicians like Donald Trump, and I'm sorry to say it, but I think he's a very skilled politician. I think that the wall is one of the most effective pieces of political imagery in recent history. Who doesn't understand a wall? Bad people, us, wall. You know, the, the, just the simplicity of the political imagery and the way he rises up. But, so, and he's uh, clearly racial resentment was a li really big factor in tipping some people towards Trump. However, there's another factor here, which is that there is a bunch of people who feel as if they're not doing all that well. And there's a bunch of people up there, not just the top 1%, but the professional classes who are doing pretty well. And if you, if you poll Trump voters, they don't hate the rich the top 1%. They hate the white collar professionals of the upper middle class. They hate the people who are in those kind of middle class institutions. They, they actually quite like that. After all, Donald Trump's very rich, but he's anti-elite, anti-expert. He manages to capture the blue collar vernacular. He brilliantly communicates, I'm one of you, not one of them. Them being the upper middle class, the professionals with their polished manners and nice suits and all that. The people who've been telling you how to live and what to eat and what to drink and what to do. Meanwhile, they all seem quite immune from trade, globalization, right? They seem to be doing pretty well. I look at them and they're, they, they seem to be doing quite well. And I'm angry about that. And here's the a, hard thing. Just a couple they're not more wrong. questions. They're not wrong. Sorry. They're uh, not wrong about that. Yeah. They're not wrong to be angry. Um, we're gonna break pretty soon for some refreshments and I'd like you to sign your books, Richard. Um, can you give, the, give us an example of countries that are doing a better job in terms of income inequality and, uh, uh, and basically helping their people f find their dreams? Well, um, there are lots of examples. I think the one that's most painful for people in the US, and therefore the one I, l I like to use, is Canada. Um, I think the American dream is alive and well, just north of the border. Uh, I'm advising the Canadian government their poverty strategy. They just introduced a child tax benefit that's reduced child poverty by 40%. Um, their policies towards immigration are much more liberal and open than ours. Um, their attitudes, I'm not saying it's a perfect country, but there's a culture there which is so much more, uh, this is much more progressive than the one in the US. And interestingly, although income inequality in Canada is not that much less than in the US, it's a bit less, but not much less actually, social mobility is much higher. And so what's interesting to me is, and the same in Australia, the UK and the US are much more class bound. We've got less mobility across class lines. Canada and Australia, although they've got similar levels of income inequality, a little bit, they've got much more mobility. And so the US and the UK share that feature of actually, although not, they are more unequal, but not that much more unequal than the other Anglo-Saxon countries, we're much more class bound. And that's, I think, because of the institutions in those countries, and in particular in Canada, the college education system is way more open, way less complex, way more straightforward. 
it takes you 30 minutes to apply to college in Canada and 40 yeah. minutes in the UK. What I'm going to do is I, I'll send, uh, give the mic to somebody who wants a question ans answered that I haven't asked. So if you'd like to raise your hand, I'll give you the mic. All right. How do you create a new progressive movement when the hoarding class has such political power that it can overturn things like changing of 529? Like this. Like this. I have no better answer than that. Like this. One person at a time, one group at a time. I have honestly no idea. And I think there's a political strategy. Everything I've set out is crazy for the short term. But I think that to some extent we get the politicians we deserve. My congressman, Chris Van Hollen, was against the 529 thing, and I take personal responsibility for that because we have created a culture in places like that where Van Hollen felt no alternative but to protect what he knows privately to be this agree. Why have we allowed that to happen? And so we stand in our own shoes, start from where I am in my house, in my community, in my school, and then at Brookings. At Brookings, we don't do take our kids to work day anymore. We take other people's kids to work who don't have parents who are in work. 150 DCPS public students came in whose parents don't work. What a terrible idea to take your own kids to work. What, so that white collar kids can see what white collar work looks like. Prepare them for their future as upper middle class kids. Whereas everyone else, so just, and then campaign, then argue for health visiting, then argue for tax. But we've got to learn to stand in our own shoes as well. Turn up at your local zoning meetings. Look at your own school district lines. Ask yourself how you vote when it comes to school integration or zoning. Are you turning up to that boring meeting about housing regulation? Join the YIMBY movement, which is a real thing, which sends people into housing things to argue for more low-income housing. And hold your breath if it's your neighborhood. It's going to be hard. I admit that it's going to be hard. But if we, if we don't start doing it ourselves, then we can't. It's no good to blame the political culture and the politicians. What are cultures made up of? People and decisions. Um, do you feel that um, in order to have a more equitable society, it has to be more homogeneous, or do you think it's really possible for a pluralist country like this to really live up to our, you know, constitution and all the rest of it? That is a great question. Um, I don't know. Um, and the evidence suggests that smaller and more homogeneous societies tend towards more egalitarian policies. Um, greater diversity of one kind or another does seem to lead towards less egalitarian policies, or to be associated with, I should say, not lead to. Um, but we don't know whether that's going to last. We don't know whether that's always going to be the case. And it's not true at city or state level, necessarily. And so I'm not sure what's going to happen nationally, but I do think there are states and cities that are quite diverse, uh, not uh, are really pretty heterogeneous, heterogeneous um, uh, who are actually pro enacting progressive policy. So at a national level, I don't know. My hope is that when I look at cities and states that are doing more, that it can be done. But I don't know. I think it's a really honest. What I will say is this, is that, look, we are in a diverse society. We need to celebrate that fact and try and make it a more egalitarian one. So... I certainly wouldn't want to rule it out. <laughs> Otherwise, where do we go? Last question, and then we'll break for refreshments. Uh, my question is uh, related to you know con congressional constituents on really on both sides of the aisle, uh, really who are very privileged. And we, we know we, we know this, and yet it can't it doesn't seem to be challenged, or we can't seem to get through what's going on. Don't S maybe. Say that again. I didn't quite uh, get the question at the end. You know, just those who were in Congress have a different set of standards from the rest rest of us, and it's on both sides of the aisle, really. I think they're all exempt from. Uh, 
higher standards, uh, standards that the rest of us have to live by. What do you mean by that when you say have different well, standards? Well, you know, that they have their, their own, um, I believe that they have their own, uh, uh, their own health care, their own uh, tax structure, um, yeah. different, yeah, different things. I if see. you could just elaborate a little bit on that. Yeah, well, I think it's a good question. And, and um, I think it speaks a bit to something that I mentioned very briefly, which is the importance of reference points come to believe that everything's relative. And that when we compare how we're doing or what the issues are, we compare ourselves to people close to ourselves who live near us, who worship with us, or go to college with us, and so on. And the problem with that is it means that the more unequal we get as a, as a society, the more unequal our reference points get. So I didn't say this, but economic segregation of our neighborhoods is rising. So our neighborhoods are more segregated by class, a little bit less racially segregated, a little bit less, still unbelievably racially segregated by international standards, but a bit, but a bit more economically segregated. And so you live, you're, more like, you're less likely to have class mixing in neighborhoods, less likely to have class mixing in colleges. I see some evidence as less likely to be class mixing in churches. And so where, where that class kind of mixing, where do we spend time with people who are on the, and those lower rungs? I mean, proper time, you know, as friends, as neighbors. Um, so our reference point changes, and that's true of Congress too. Um, and so what you'll see is every member of Congress now has a four-year college degree, I think. You should double check that, but at last time. I, so they're obsessed with four-year college debt. They never talk about community college. Well, understandably, because they all went to a four-year college, and every single one of their kids goes to four-year college, and they're mostly millionaires. Mostly millionaires. And so it's not saying bad about them as individuals, but it means that their world is very different to the world that's lived in by the people that many of them represent. You know, these are very professional, highly educated, upper-middle-class millionaires in Congress. And so their reference point and their architecture of the world is necessarily class-bound as well. And I think that's illuminated in the things that they choose to spend their time talking about. And I've mentioned a couple of them before. And so you will see this real asymmetry in the, th in the things that they're interested in. And I also think they've lost sight of what actually the numbers involved are. During the 529 debate, when the Republicans was talking about the fact that there are families on you know, 100,000, 100, 120,000, um, a year, you know, middle, middle class families struggling to make ends meet, etc. At the time, median household income was 47,000. So I actually think they don't know. I mean, no one knows. We don't know. But they don't know what the income distribution really looks like and where they are on it. And so it means they have a distorted view of the world too. They, by the way, also are some of the worst offenders in terms of hiring and using unpaid interns. Many, many, many of whom come through personal connections. And I'm not making a political point, the Obama White House, full of them. <laughs> and so, in terms of opportunity hoarding, loss of reference point bias, I'm sorry to say that some of our representatives are very, very, very out of touch. And that's our problem too, because we elect them. Well, thank you very, very much, Richard. Very instructive, thank you for the questions. Thank you for your questions. Really it's been a long day for Richard. He was at 92nd Street Y uh, today, and he, he's come over here and given us um, some challenges to work on.